Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled LGBT Addiction Treatment, Viewing Recovery Through the Spiritual Lens. I'm Tom Valentino, Senior Editor of Addiction Professional. Today's program is sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network. Thank you to our sponsor and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we have a few details that we'd like to go over. Each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. If you cannot see this area, simply click the red Q&A button. To download a copy of the presentation, please click the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. If you have any technical issues during the program, please click the yellow help button to troubleshoot the issue. A special note about CE credit. To receive credit for this program, you must click the green CE certificate widget at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. You must watch the webinar for at least 50 minutes in order to obtain a certificate. If you're watching the program in a group, please download the group submission form located in the resources list and follow the instructions. If you have any issues with this process, do not reach out to our sponsor as they will not be able to assist you in receiving a certificate. Please note CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event. Finally, you can also tweet during the live webinar by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the event hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, T.J. Woodward. T.J. is a spiritual author, inspirational speaker, awakening coach, and addiction counselor who has helped countless people through his simple yet powerful teachings. T.J. serves as the spiritual care counselor at Foundation's San Francisco Intensive Outpatient Treatment Program and is the founding spiritual director of Awakened Living in San Francisco. Additionally, he is in private practice as a spiritual counselor and awakening coach and the host of Awakened Living TV and Awakened Living Radio. Thank you, TJ, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you so much, Tom, and welcome, everyone. We are going to be discussing LGBT addiction treatment today and viewing addiction and addiction recovery through the spiritual lens. A little bit about LGBT addiction and some LGBT addiction uh, statistics and simply said this, statistics show that addiction rates within the LGBT community are substantially higher than that in the mainstream population. There are many factors that contribute to this unfortunate reality. Issues of shame, disenfranchisement, and isolation from family and community are potential driving forces of the L LGBT population's higher addictive tendencies. Whether it's unresolved trauma, attachment issues, or deep spiritual disconnection, the specific cultural and psychological challenges facing the LGBT community often present barriers to recovery. A little bit about me, as Tom already mentioned, I am uh, a spiritual author, inspirational speaker, awakening coach, and addiction counselor. Uh, I'm not going to read my whole bio here. I do want to speak to what uh, really has drawn me to present this webinar today with LGBT addiction treatment as a, as a gay man who has been in recovery for 30 years and has been working in the addiction field off and on for about 25 years. I have a unique calling to speak about this and speak to this population and the unique needs and uh, specific cultural needs of the LGBT community. So our objectives for today, today's webinar are to discuss methods of identifying a recovery path and a support system for the long-term health and recovery of your LGBT patients and clients. We will examine the role of authenticity and vulnerability in the treatment process and the therapeutic relationship. And we will identify technique, techniques to help LGBT patients dismantle core false beliefs that keep them stuck 
in a pattern of relapse and hopelessness. So let's explore together some techniques and practices that will not only address the particular needs of LGBT patients, but will also assist them in breaking free of lifelong destructive patterns. We're also going to explore some effective approaches in creating a safe space for LGBT patients to go deeper into core material that is trapped in the subconscious, which will empower them to connect with their deepest truth. So the lineup of what we're going to be addressing today, we're gonna to begin by looking at some of the specific cultural needs of our LGBT clients and patients. Uh, some statistical information specific to LGBT patients. We're gonna talk about what it means or what I mean when I say viewing addiction through the spiritual lens. And we're gonna talk about how we can assist clients with integrating a fragmented or the fragmented self. From there, we're gonna move into looking at uh, how we treat symptoms and how we look beneath those symptoms into some of the root causes specifically the three root causes that we're going to be addressing today in viewing addiction and recovery through the spiritual lens. We're going to be talking about toxic shame, unresolved trauma, and spiritual disconnection. Then we will move into how we address these underlying issues by creating and holding a space. And as I said at the beginning, how we use authenticity and vulnerability in the therapeutic relationship to assist our patients in breaking free, and uh, also how we assist people in uncovering some of the core false beliefs that are driving this addictive behavior. And then finally, we're, we'll close with spending a little bit of time talking about the relevance and the importance of each of us as clinicians, whatever our role is, in doing our own deeper inner work. So let's begin by addressing some of the specific cultural needs of our LGBT clients. This quote from Aaron Mooney, I think, speaks really well to some of the specific cultural needs. Specialized substance abuse treatment programs for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, LGBT, individuals are limited. Specialized treatment programs offer unique and tailored services to special populations in order to provide effective treatment. The services offered in these programs are proven to be especially helpful and effective for LGBT individuals. Many researchers have suggested that LGBT-specific substance abuse programs have better treatment outcomes for LGBT individuals than mainstream treatment programs. LGBT individuals have been said to have much higher rates of substance abuse than their heterosexual counterparts. They also face discrimination, prejudice, negative attitudes and behavior, and unique life experiences that different, differ from the majority populace, which lead to their unique needs in substance abuse treatment. So let's spend a little time looking at some LGBT addiction statistics and what drives higher addiction rates within the LGBT community. Some statistics are this. None of, and all of this, by the way, the source is the need for specialized programs for LGBT individuals in substance abuse treatment by Aaron Mooney, uh, Southern Illinois University. I found this to be an incredible resource for those of us who are looking for the statistical information to support the work we're doing with our LGBT clients. So starting at the top with the first bullet point, none of the special populations have more significant involvement with substance abuse and dependence rates than the LGBT population. Several studies have estimated that substance abuse affects 28 to 35 percent of the LGBT population, and it's estimated that substance abuse affects only 10 to 12 percent of the general population. And I want to pause there and really speak to the significance of that. So if we look at the numbers, we're looking at two to three times higher addiction rates within the LGBT uh, community. And what we're gonna be talking about today is some of those root causes that may be driving that addictive behavior. This fourth bullet point says, 
this, and I think this is incredibly valid, one proposed cause for the high rates of substance abuse in the LGBT population is the lack of safe places to socialize outside of gay bars. We know that as there is more and more acceptance with LGBT folks in mainstream communities, that this is going to be something that is shifting. And yet for most of our LGBT clients at this point, it, at least in some way, that is one factor to what might be driving higher addiction rates. And again, we're going to be delving into some of what those may be from a spiritual perspective. Let's talk about some of the possible barriers to recovery. Outcomes of substance use treatment can rely on how the counselor perceives the person in treatment. And in this study, it is suggested that negative attitudes toward the LGBT community operate as a persistent and obsessive stressor predicting poor mental health outcomes such as depression, demoralization, guilt, and suicidal ideation in those who feel stigmatized. The same research state, researchers state, even if treatment providers have good intentions and attempt to provide optimal treatment for all their clients, the possibility remains that subtle biases against LGBT clients may influence the treatment process. In one study, it was shown that most negative attitudes held about the LGBT population were directed toward bisexual and transgender individuals. And so we recognize that on a conscious or maybe unconscious level, uh, folks who enter treatment programs that don't have specific training or specific focus on LGBT treatment are often uh, subtly and sometimes not so subtly discriminated against and, again, quite often unconscious by clinicians who have an unconscious bias uh, against LGBT folks. So even if there's not something that maybe someone feels is really tangible, I've sat with many patients who have gone to treatment programs who have said to me, not something I can put my finger on, but there was just something there that made me feel unsafe. And we're certainly going to talk about that more as the webinar goes on. So I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about LGBT only uh, versus, maybe a strange word, but versus LGBT track. LGBT specific treatment services are defined by Cochrane, PV, and, and Rodham at 2007 as treatment programs that have demonstrated adequate cultural sensitivity to the specific treatment needs and concerns of LGBT clients. And in this next study, it was found that 57% of gay and bisexual participants in their particular study said that they thought their sexual orientation had negative effect in their treatment. In this next study, it was found that those who were in treatment with a specialized program for LGBT individuals had a much higher rate of abstinence once they completed the program than those LGBT clients who were not in specialized treatment for LGBT individuals. This last point is really, um, I think, a very important point for us to recognize, and that is research from one study that I looked at indicated a much higher abstinence rate for a group of gay men who completed a residential treatment program with an LGBT specialized track. Their long-term, this was looked at one year out, their abstinence rate was substantially higher than both their straight counterparts and a group of gay men who were in LGBT-only treatment. I think that's a really important uh, point here, and we're going to delve a little bit more into that. I actually want to spend a little time telling uh, a story of, out of my own professional experience that I speak that I think speaks profoundly to the importance and the validity and the efficacy of LGBT track treatment. In 2009, I, when I was working at a foundation facility as a residential counselor, I, I just want to share a couple of personal experiences that really have led me to my own passion for assisting LGBT folks in treatment. And I want to talk about a couple of different case studies. Of course, I'm going to change their names uh, for confidentiality purposes. 
what happened is in our first case study, and we're going to call him Ron, he was a gay man in his 40s. He came to our program after attempting suicide at another residential treatment program and was sent to our program because it was felt that in the Bay Area he would be better accepted and would have an opportunity uh, to, you know, share and work through some of his is issues around internalized homophobia. Um, at the root of this suicide attempt was his deep sense of shame about his orientation, and he was really only out to a few people in his life and really kept his sexual orientation a secret the first time he was in treatment. At that same time, a second client who we'll call Stephen came to our program, and this was a, a young man in his 20s who was incredibly out. Uh, by, you know, from a stereotypical perspective, it was, you know, he was very, very obviously effeminate gay man, and he was very vocal about his orientation. So what was striking to me is that we had these two different gay clients in our program um, coming from a very different place in terms of their own um, ability to work through some of their issues around being LGBT. As I mentioned, the first, uh, first patient, Ron, was incredibly closeted and terrified to let anybody know. Uh, of course, a lot of this was based on his age and his upbringing and some of this internalized homophobia and shame that he had experienced in his life. So we had these two clients in our program, and we also had a large group of straight male clients who had never met a gay man, at least, at least to their knowledge. And I, what I want to share with you is a, a powerful story of healing that really uh, transpired and has, a, has impacted the way I treat and work with LGBT folks. Uh, the clients were on the way to an outside meeting, and they were in the van. And the client that was deeply closeted, Ron, was in the van, and some of the guys in the van were saying some really overtly homophobic comments. And the driver, the counselor that was driving the van, didn't really know what to say or what to do. So what he did is he did nothing. He actually um, kind of closed off, didn't know what to do. And in his own words, I froze and didn't know what to say to these guys. And so obviously it was an incredibly damaging experience for this patient that was deeply closeted. Um, he had come out to me, so he came to me and told me this experience. And what happened is a large number of the people on the clinical team wanted to ask these guys that said the homophobic remarks. They actually wanted to throw them out of treatment because they said that kind of language is unacceptable or inappropriate, and we can't have this here. Uh, our clinical director, uh, Krista Gilbert, she was our clinical director at the time, uh, had a profoundly different perspective, and I think this perspective was really incredibly powerful. She said, we would miss the clinical opportunity if we were just to throw these guys out of our program. What about sitting down with them and talking with them about where they got their ideas about gay men uh, and talk that through with them? So I ended up sitting down with all of these guys individually and talking with them about the experience. Obviously, I could not let them know there was someone in the van that was deeply closeted and, and had really caused a great deal of harm. But what I did is I shared my own experience of being a gay man and what it was like hearing those types of things and how that can be detrimental to recovery and it can lead to addiction. Uh, three out of these four men asked if they could come to the LGBT group the following day to make amends. And it was an incredibly beautiful experience because what happened is these men who had no idea, at least on a conscious level, that their words could be so damaging, it ended up being an opportunity for something that was incredibly healing because we had this LGBT-specific group or track within the mainstream program. It allowed a space for these two different, seemingly different types of people, if you will, to interact, to come together, and to really bring uh, this story and what had happened into the light. It allowed our, our client, Ron, to, in a safe way, come out to some straight men. That was his choice, and it was an incredibly healing experience. At that same time, we had Stephen, as I mentioned, who was the 20-something, very out gay young man, who was also there, and what happened, what transpired is because of this opportunity, because we clinically chose to not uh, throw these guys out of the program, we allowed them to come into the group 
to share and to heal. Uh, at the end, when our client Stephen graduated, his, our, our client Stephen only wrote in purple glitter pen. That was his kind of his trademark. These guys that had said the homophobic things in the van actually gave him this big card when he graduated, written in glitter pen, to our first gay friend, we love you. So this is a personal experience of how healing can happen when we have uh, clients in an LGBT track within the mainstream population. Um, also, we recognize that sometimes it is appropriate to send our patients to LGBT-only treatment for a period of time if they have some severe trauma to work through or they just don't feel safe, for example. Uh, I've worked with a lot of gay men who don't feel safe around straight men, and maybe they need a period of time, maybe there's a residential program to send them to, to get that initial healing so that then they can come uh, to maybe an outpatient program like at Foundation San Francisco. We started an LGBT track about two years ago, and it has been an incredible experience of healing and providing a space for people that is safe where they can um, have an opportunity to share things maybe in a process group where they wouldn't with the mainstream population and at the same time uh, being integrated into the mainstream program offers an opportunity not only for the LGBT patients but for the heterosexual counterparts as well to be open to uh, different people and to have that be a, a really an opportunity a spiritual opportunity in recovery so let's shift shift gears now, switch gears, and talk about what I mean by viewing addiction through the spiritual lens. The spiritual lens, we recognize that there are multiple aspects to treating addiction. The Buddhists call it the four rooms, that we live in these four rooms, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And what we recognize is that in holistic integrated treatment, uh, that treatment addresses all four of these aspects. But today what we're going to be exploring is the spiritual aspect of both addiction and addiction treatment. So what I mean by the spiritual lens is this. In my experience, in my own life, and certainly in working with patients and clients, it seems that we come into this world whole and perfect, absolutely connected with our true nature, whether we call that God, the universe, source, spirit, etc. That spiritual essence is who and what we come in as, and we come in with an inherent connection with that essential self. So viewing addiction through this spiritual lens means that we recognize that on some level there has been a separation from that essential self or that true self quite often at an early age. Uh, this is often quite pronounced in our LGBT folks, which we'll get into a little bit more as the webinar goes on. I see our role as clinicians, uh, I see our role is assisting our patients in integrating back to the wholeness and reconnecting with a sense of love and purpose. And that's really what I mean by viewing addiction through the spiritual lens and viewing recovery through the spiritual lens. So how do we assist our clients in integrating with the fragmented self? And what I mean by the fragmented self is what we spoke about in that separation that happens quite often at an early age from that essential self. This quote from Dr. Alan Downs, who wrote the book The Velvet Rage, I think speaks to it really well. The damaging part of learning to live your life in two parts whether in reality or fantasy, cannot be underestimated. It is an infectious skill that you learned, one that would eventually spread beyond the bedroom of your life. Life wasn't ever what it seemed on the surface. Nothing could be trusted for what it appeared to be. After all, you weren't what you appeared to be. In learning to hide part of yourself, you lost the ability to trust anything or anyone fully. Without knowing it, you traded humane innocence for dry cynicism. And Dr. Down's book is written specifically to gay men, and he writes about what it's like to be a gay man living in a straight person's world. So this idea that there's this separation because of these two lives that are lived, 
this double life for so many gay people where we are hiding part of our identity because possibly we're afraid to let our authentic self show. So let's talk a little bit about attachment theory. Of course, many of us have studied attachment theory. So simply said, as we know, an infant really needs to develop a relationship with at least one primary caregiver for the child's successful social and emotional development, and in particular for learning how to effectively regulate feelings. As a result of covert or overt abuse, whether it's sexual, physical, emotional, and or neglect, there is a closing off and a separation that inhibits a person's ability to develop basic trust in their caregivers, and even more importantly, in their self. There's a fragmentation from the essential self. And as we know, this often leads to addictive patterns and addictive behavior later in life. I want to speak a little bit about a framework that has really assisted me in my work, and I call that brilliant strategy. So let's delve into that a little bit. Due to separation, our patients often develop strategies for survival. We often call those coping mechanisms. What happened for me is I discovered that it was useful to assist patients in reframing these as brilliant strategies rather than calling them coping mechanisms because they were actually brilliant at the time and in many cases quite literally saved their lives. The issue, of course, is that these strategies have become maladaptive. And when I can assist a patient in shifting that, that, that mental construct, there, there have been some really dramatically powerful and positive results because as long as they're looking at their addiction uh, as a coping mechanism, there's a negative connotation to that. And when I assist someone in reframing that as a brilliant strategy that is no longer working, something really changes dramatically. So our work as clinicians is to assist patients in discovering and dismantling those strategies that help that actually keep them trapped in addictive patterns. Uh, and that's to me really the bulk of this work of assisting someone in breaking free, rather than viewing their addiction as, as a negative or something that's bad, we reframe that and recognize that the, it was seeking something. And through the spiritual lens, you might even say that it's some sort of low-level search for spiritual connection. So let's talk about what I mean by being a field of presence in the therapeutic relationship. In individual or group settings, we as clinicians have, of course, a spectrum of choices in how we facilitate and create the therapeutic alliance and facilitate the therapeutic process. In my, in my experience, we can either force our agenda or we can be a field of presence and allow our clients to explore their own journey. In this paradigm, we see ourselves as gently steering the process rather than over-asserting our will. Using the power in this way, we use the power of the current instead of forcing our patient down the river of discovery. And the analogy, the reason I use the boat analogy is I remember early in my uh, evolution as a group facilitator, I really thought that my, jo my job was to steer the, the process and steer the conversation. And, and really, I imagined that I was like a boat putting my motor in the water and just kind of, you know, forcing my way through. And I recognized at one point that it was far more powerful to simply be a presence and create a space where the flow of the group actually began, could begin to almost facilitate itself. And I found a powerfully positive results in that. So let's talk a little bit about symptoms and root causes. In my experience, uh, many of us as clinicians look at symptoms without often getting down to some of the root causes. So I want to talk about how we move beyond behavior. So as I said, many modalities of treatment and therapy focus on behavior. And of course, they are useful reparative interventions for many of our clients. You might even say for most. But what about the chronic relapser? Because what I notice is in many programs, we have an idea that this is short term. We want to stabilize our patient. We want to work on some very specific 
uh, measurable behaviors so that we can stabilize them and get them into long-term care. And while, while I recognize that that's a very important and useful uh, modality and construct, we often also see patients that repeat, come repeatedly to our program uh, present as chronic relapsers. And so to me, we, 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 it, it, what it calls for is us to look deeper and beyond the behavior and ask the question, what about the chronic relapser who is experiencing toxic shame, who has unresolved trauma, and has a deep sense of a spiritual disconnection? Most likely a patient who is a chronic relapser has at least one of these three underlying issues that keep them stuck in a pattern of self-destructive behavior. The treatment for these always starts with the same intervention, creating the space by being a field of presence. And I want to speak a little bit uh, specifically about LGBT folks. If you look at these three root causes, toxic shame, unresolved trauma, and deep spiritual disconnection. And again, I'm recognizing that what we're talking about today, we recognize there's a physical, mental, and emotional aspect of addiction and treatment as well. We're really talking about the root causes of this spirit, spiritual disconnection, this trauma, and this shame that creates the addictive behavior. If you look at LGBT folks, it seems that all, most if not all, have are carrying around a sense of toxic shame because we live in a culture where the pervasive um, consciousness is that there's something fundamentally wrong with someone for being an LGBT person. Again, we recognize in a very beautiful way that this is changing rapidly in consciousness, and we're recognizing that people that are now in their teens and 20s aren't having that same type of experience, and yet most of our LGBT patients still have a deep sense of shame, or they're carrying around a shame core. Many a, Being an LGBT person in our culture is by its very nature traumatic, and there's often a very strong sense of disconnection with our LGBT patients. So let's talk a little bit about toxic shame. This quote from John Bradshaw from his book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, speaks to it well. Toxically shamed people tend to become more and more stagnant as life goes on. They live in a guarded, secretive, and defensive way. They try to be more than human, perfect and controlling, or less than human, losing interest in life or stagnated in some addictive behavior. I thought that quote spoke really well to the root of shame. And, of course, in this conversation, it's natural that we talk a bit about the difference between guilt and shame. And as many of us know very clearly, guilt is a sense of I've done something wrong, while shame is I am wrong or there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Being an LGBT person in our society often creates a deep shame core and in many spiritual practice, incl practices, including 12-step programs, there's a strong focus on making amends. And while this is a wonderful remedy for dealing with guilt, because, of course, it allows a person to clean up their mistakes, uh, it often does not address the underlying issue of toxic shame. And, of course, we know we work with guilt and shame in a very different way. So some of the symptoms of shame, of course, this list could be much longer, sexual compulsivity, grandiosity, low self-esteem, and depression. Let's shift now to what I see as the second root cause of addictive behavior through the spiritual lens, and that is unresolved trauma. This quote is from Alice Miller. The truth about our childhood is stored up in our body, and although we can repress it, we can never alter it. Our intellect can be deceived, our feelings manipulated, and conceptions confused, and our body tricked with medication. But someday our body will present its bill, for it, for it is as incorruptible as a child who, still whole in spirit, will accept no compromises or excuses, and it will not stop tormenting us until we stop evading the truth. So how do we work with trauma? Of course, what we just heard from that quote, and as many of us know in working with addiction 
And in the field of mental health, we recognize that trauma does stay trapped in the body. So there are many techniques and modalities that will assist in treating our patients with trauma, recognizing that it can be a complex issue that requires partnering. And one of the things that I feel strongly about in working in the addiction field, certainly in residential and even at the IOP level of care, is that it's very important that we partner with experts with our patients who are working through uh, trauma. And so some of the experts we might partner with are uh, people who specialize in EMDR, somatic experiencing, mindfulness-based therapies, and attachment theory specialists. I have seen often we don't connect patients with these experts early enough, and that results in little time to create a safe space for them, which is needed in order for them to integrate into their daily lives, integrate these practices and become an integrated whole person. The most effective strategies include partnering early on and collaborating throughout the treatment episode, episode rather than waiting until the end of treatment. Some of the symptoms of trauma, and of course this list could be longer, eating, disorder, eating disorders or body dysmorphia, low self-esteem, lack of purpose or direction, and attraction to abusive partners. So let's talk now about what I consider to be the third root cause of addictive behavior through the spiritual lens, and that is spiritual disconnection. This quote from David Earle speaks well to what I mean by spiritual disconnection. The key problem I encounter working with wounded, depressed, and unhappy people is a lack of connection starting from a disconnection with themselves and then with others. This is why love often becomes so distorted and destructive. When people experience a disconnection from themselves, they feel it but, knew, but do not realize the problem. I want to share a little bit of my own personal story because I think it speaks well to how, how – Spiritual disconnection specifically has led me to do the work that I do and has informed the work I do with, with patients. Uh, at age seven, I had a physical sensation of closing off, of shutting down. I actually remember like it was yesterday. So my brilliant strategy at age seven was to build a wall around my heart and try to protect myself and keep myself safe. So at the age of 13, I ended up discovering drugs and alcohol, and those addictions became the solution or the brilliant strategy to this closed off and shut down experience. Throughout my life, I had a constant, or my early life, constant outward seeking. Uh, I, I did get clean and sober at age 20, but that certainly wasn't the end of my outward seeking. We often hear in 12-step programs that we have a God-shaped hole, and sometimes we will say that only God can fill that. And in my own journey, I have come to understand and recognize that rather than thinking there's something that needs to fill that hole up, I've un begun to understand that on some level that is a part of who and what I am, and there's an essential self or a spiritual self that is underneath that is, that is unharmed and unharmable. And of course, what led to a lot of this, one of the key factors was feeling so different for being gay growing up in the 1970s in Indiana and not having gay role models and feeling incredibly different than other people. And of course, using a lot of shame and secrecy as a way to work with that. So let's go through some of the symptoms of spiritual disconnection. And again, this list could certainly be longer. Lack of purpose, low self-esteem, seeking outward validation, through jobs, through money, relationships, codependent addictive relationships. So let's talk about how we address some of these underlying issues. This quote from Judith Lewis Herman from her book, Trauma and Recovery, speaks to it well. Recovery unfolds in three stages. The central task of the first stage is the establishment of safety. The central task of the second stage is remembrance and mourning. 
the central focus of the third stage is reconnection with ordinary life. So let's talk about how we do some resolve some of these issues. There are three effective methodologies which have been proven as highly effective interventions that can really help all of our patients, specifically our LGBT patients, in permanently breaking free from some of these underlying issues and shift into a life, a life of contentment. Creating and holding a safe space, authenticity and vulnerability, and uncovering core false beliefs. Let's start with what I mean by creating and holding a safe space. I'm not going to read this quote. I'm going to let you read that on your own. We're going to move to the next slide. What I mean by holding a space. Holding a space involves seeing our patients as inherently whole and perfect rather than viewing them as their diagnosis. Power, powerful shifts happen when we view the patient through this spiritual lens. And I have seen profound and dramatic results from this simple shift in my awareness. I remember early in my career in working in this field, I was viewing patients as being damaged or their mental health diagnosis or their addiction. When I began viewing them through this spiritual lens, profound shifts happened. We potentially do a disservice to our clients when we view them as fundamentally broken rather than opening to the possibility that their symptoms are simply a smoke screen of maladaptive strategies. What if underneath that is inherent wholeness and perfection? Creating this type of non-judgmental, open-hearted space does involve doing our own deeper inner work, which we're going to talk more about. Let's talk a bit about the role of authenticity and vulnerability in the therapeutic process. This quote from Don Miguel Ruiz and his son Don Jose Ruiz is from their book, The Fifth Agreement. It's time to come back from the world of illusion, the world of lies, and return to your own truth, to your own authenticity. It's time to unlearn the lies and become the real you. And in order to do that, we need to come back to life, which is truth. Awareness is the key to coming back to life. Where you rebel against all the lies that you are ruling, that are ruling your head. You rebel and the whole dream starts changing. The therapeutic relationship. The recent work of Brene Brown is showing us the power of authenticity and vulnerability in the therapeutic process. As clinicians, it's important that we are authentic, authentically engaged in this process. In other words, we bring ourselves into the room. This is one of the most powerful ways we can create a safe therapeutic alliance. And what I mean by bringing ourselves into the room is that we allow ourselves to have the appropriate emotional response to our client's process. For example, we may reflect back to our clients that something we're hearing elicits an emotional response from us, like, I feel sad when I'm hearing you say that. And this is something, of course, that uh, is actually controversial in some therapeutic circles because we're often told we're supposed to only be a blank canvas. And yet I have seen something really powerful happen, not through a lot of self-disclosure, but through being really present in the room and allowing and modeling what it's like to have an appropriate emotional response. So let's dive now a little bit into what I mean by uncovering core false beliefs. This quote from Carl Jung, I think, says it very simply and powerfully, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. I want to talk a little bit about the power of I am. It's abundantly clear to me that people who suffer from addiction often carry very dense negative core false beliefs, such as I am not good enough, I am not lovable, or I am not worthy. And of course, many LGBT patients don't even realize this is happening and it is trapped in their subconscious and therefore directing their lives. Assisting them in uncovering this core material and reframing these as an incredibly effective and powerful tool that can produce instantly positive results. And to me, this is a revolutionary new way of assisting our patients in seeing themselves 
most of our patients are walking around with these negative core false beliefs, and most of them are not even aware that it's happening. So simply having a moment of awareness can shift this dramatically. One of the tools that I have found to be incredibly effective in working with these core false beliefs is self-parenting. And of course, what we know about self-parenting is it, it involves teaching or modeling for our patients a way to dialogue with their perceived wounded inner child. The three key phrases that for me are fundamental in assisting them in breaking some of these deep inner wounds or these core false beliefs is to simply have a dialogue with that inner wounded child saying, it is okay to feel that way. It's safe now. You are safe now. And I'm here for you. Because of course, what we recognize is that most of our patients believe if, if they really let us see them, they are gonna get abandoned. Of course, that's through early family systems where that was modeled. So assisting our LGBT patients in learning how to reparent themselves using positive self-talk and self-love can assist them in identifying and dislodging some of these core false beliefs. And this will allow them to ride the wave of the emotional experience. Because as we know, uh, many of our patients have a very difficult time learning how to be with what they consider to be negative emotions. So of course, assisting them in learning how to be with that and ride the wave of those emotions is incredibly powerful. I want to talk a little bit about unlearning as a spiritual concept and as a therapeutic modality. The recovery process to me is really more about unlearning than it is about learning. Again, unlearning the core false ideas about the self. Experiencing ourselves as love is the most natural thing in the world. And if we don't use the word love, we could say our true nature. And again, this is through the spiritual lens. And the path to remembering ourselves as love or as wholeness or perfection is really one of dismantling and unlearning everything we've been taught that contradicts this truth. Uh, I've had profound breakthroughs with patients in simply speaking to them through the framework of unlearning rather than learning. Because as we know, so many of our patients come in with a deep sense of brokenness or feeling broken and they feel like they have to do it perfectly or they have to learn how and learn to. And sometimes assisting them in recognizing this framework of what if, because I will ask it as a question, what if underneath all of that is an inherent whole and perfect self? And this is about unlearning and letting go of those ideas that stand in our way of experiencing that. And that has been an incredibly powerful process. So finally, in our last few minutes, I want to talk about uh, to me, where this all points, and that is doing our own inner work as clinicians. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time from the Buddhist teacher and author Pema Chodron from her book, The Places That Scare You. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes re real when we recognize our shared humanity. And I also will modify this sometimes and recognize that I cannot be present with someone else's light unless I'm also in relationship with my own. So finally, what I mean by the inner work, and I think all of us who have worked in this field for any time recognize the importance of this, and it's simply said, ultimately, in order to assist our patients in going deeper, it's paramount that each of us do our own inner work because what I've experienced is we can only take a client as deep as we are willing to go in our own journey. And if we have not done our own inner work, then we will either consciously or unconsciously prevent or attempt to prevent the client from going deeper. And so what that means is a patient can often not evolve past our own level of awareness and understanding, and you could even say consciousness. So thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation, LGBT addiction treatment, viewing recovery through the spiritual lens. Thank you so, so much for your presence. All right, TJ, thank you. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, really great presentation. Um, before we get to the Q&A portion of the event, I'd like to now hand things over to Leah Boone from Foundations for a few words from our sponsor. 
Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help, to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration, and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to get involved, give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2016 to register for any future 6K events. Back to you, Tom. All right. Thanks, Leah. Uh, We have already had a number of questions come in um, from the audience. We'd also like to remind you that you can use the Q&A widget uh, to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. And uh, we are also past the 50-minute mark, so now is also a great time to consider filling out your CE certificate information uh, by clicking the green CE widget. But uh, let's get into some questions here. Early on in the uh, presentation, TJ, we had a question asking if you have any stats on counselors who are LGBTQ who show negative bias due to assimilation in themselves to the hetero population. Well, this is a a great question. I have not specifically researched that. I mean, one, another aspect of that, I have certainly also worked with LGBT clinicians that might also have a bias maybe against heterosexual patients. So, I think in the end, um, I I would love to look at some research and some statistics around that. I have not done that research. Ultimately, uh, you know, where we ended the webinar is uh, a recognition of us doing our own inner work. And certainly part of doing my own inner work and what I've seen in others is the ability for us to, uh, in a safe way, recognize our own prejudices because as human beings, we inherently have those. We talked a lot about, you know, some of these core false beliefs, certainly we as humans and clinicians have that as well. And so, you know, creating a safe space for us to do our own inner work of unlearning can be a great tool. Um, But I've not done specific research around that, but I would love to, I would love to do that. Okay. Um, We had a couple of similar questions along the lines of this topic. Um, How might you help a client who is incarcerated work on their sexual identity? Well, that's, I think that can be a really complex issue, right, because certainly if someone's incarcerated in a prison system, uh, most likely safety is going to be paramount there, right? So there may not be the ability for, you know, we're, we're, if we're working in residential treatment, we're going to be able to create a safe space for an LGBT patient when it feels appropriate for them perhaps to come out to a larger group. Uh, we're, when working with a, a prison population, which I have not done, but I can only imagine that it, it would be, first and foremost, would be safety, you know, their physical safety. So it seems that the work would probably be more individual and someone working on some of their own internalized homophobia and shame uh, and then recognizing that it may or, not be, may or may not be safe actually to come out or to speak about that in the general population. Although, of course, it might be, but that's something that I think we would have to really carefully uh, work with. All right. Um, Let's shift gears here. Would you have any tips or recommendations for people working with clients in rural areas that have little to no LGBT-specific services? Absolutely. I think that if, uh, of course, we're very blessed now to have the Internet and to have access to um, a myriad of experiences that we can find online. Um, If someone is an LGBT folk in a rural area that is struggling with addiction, certainly uh, moving them to a space or a program that has LGBT specific focus, I think could be incredibly healing for that, for that patient um, as they can, you know, connect with other LGBT folks. If that's not the issue, they're not needing, needing treatment. Um, certainly it would be about Googling what kind of different support groups are available online. I know that it's happening more and more and more. And one of the dynamics that we're seeing shifting right now in LGBT culture is, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, an LGBT folk, if they got in touch with their orientation, would move to a major city. That was just pretty much how people needed to do it in order to feel safe. That's why the LGBT communities in major metropolitan areas have thrived. 
we're seeing a shift in that as people are, are being more, they're more accepted by their families, they're more accepted by their immediate community. So people are staying in rural areas, which I see as a sign of, of growth, and I think it's a wonderful thing, and they may lack um, the resources or the ability to connect with other LGBT folk that will provide a shared experience that's useful. So I would say, you know, look for some resources online, and also if they need treatment, you know, there's certainly uh, great treatment programs where they could go and then come back to their community after that. Okay. Um, how do you navigate conversations with clients where the, the just the term spiritual in and of itself is triggering because uh, maybe the uh, the client had uh, past spiritual traumas? Great question, and I love this. Whoever asked it, thank you so much. I think that the word spiritual can be a loaded word, kind of like God. What I do in my spiritual counseling sessions with a patient in their first week or two of treatment is I do a spiritual assessment. And my first question is getting a sense of what they grew up with. So did they grow up with religion? Did they grow up with spirituality in their home, in their community? And then my second question is what is the difference between spirituality and religion? And then they get to talk about their own definition of what they might call spirituality. Then my third question comes naturally. Based on that, are you interested or would spirituality play a role in your recovery? And what we, what we find is someone's definition of spirituality might be really based in religion. Someone else might have a sense of spirituality, but they're, they consider themselves to be atheist. So it's really about assisting them in creating their own idea and their own definition. And, of course, if the word spiritual doesn't work, then, you know, I'll work with a patient to come up with a, another word or a different word. But it's always about creating a space for them to share what it means to them. All right. Um, in the addiction field, there is an underlying belief for some folks that uh, you cannot effectively treat someone if you've never had an addiction. Uh, it's worth pointing out here that the uh, listener who submitted this question says that they don't per personally believe this, but they're wondering, is there the same assumption for the LGBT community? This is a great question, and I've been in this conversation with several programs. Uh, I started the LGBT track at Foundation San Francisco, and we recognized that there were very few LGBT-specific tracks in the Bay Area, which was shocking. So I've had an opportunity to go to several different programs in the area and really work with them and help them develop an LGBT track. And this question is one that comes up multiple times. And the way I'll answer it is, in the same way that it's not necessary that someone be an addict or an alcoholic in order to treat someone, I would say that it, it isn't necessary for someone to be LGBT to work with LGBT folks. Now, what happens, though, is there's a degree of safety that gets created because LGBT clients, I think, have maybe a higher level of sensitivity around judgment or acceptance. So I think the, simple, in the simplest way would be if you do have an LGBT clinician that can run those groups, it's going to be a lot, you know, maybe a safer space for the client. I, of course, envision a time as we evolve that that's going to become less and less necessary. I don't know if that really answered. It's kind of a yes and no, maybe, or it's a case by case. Okay. Uh, we've had a lot of great questions coming in, and we want to thank everybody who submitted them. We're going to uh, get one more here in um, under the bell. Um, do you have any resources that you could share um, that you found as being helpful alternatives for clients who want to connect with the community but not necessarily through the local bar scene? Right. That goes back to the first, the, the first uh, point early on in the webinar where so many LGBT folks, that's the way they can socialize, which could be a contributing factor to higher addiction rates. It totally depends on where a person lives and what's happening in that community. Obviously, in large cities, there's a lot more resources. Most major cities have an LGBT center. That's a great resource for people to connect in different ways. Another great uh, resource is Meetup. You know, you can go to meetup.com. You can look for uh, groups, different types of people that meet. Certainly, I see a lot of LGBT-focused groups for people that want to connect you know, maybe in a more, um, let's say, less triggering way for someone that's in, in recovery and more um, more grounded in, in a, a more authentic connection. So those are a couple of resources I would suggest. 
All right. Very good. Well, TJ, thank you again very much. Um, super informative all around. Uh, that's going to be all the time we have for questions today. We do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. And again, should you have any issues with this process, uh, please do not reach out to our sponsors. They're not going to be able to help you uh, in receiving your certificate. Um, to receive your certificate for the program, you must click on the green program evaluation widget, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, you can download the Group Submission Guide and Program Evaluation located in the Resources area and follow the instructions provided. For those watching from a mobile device or tablet, you'll need to email the Help Desk to receive a program evaluation and certificate for this program. Please note that the CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event here today on September 29, 2016. If you have any questions about this, please click the purple contact the webinar help desk widget at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on Tuesday, October 25th for our upcoming Addiction Professional Webinar sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network. The program Women, Trauma, and Addiction will be presented by Marie Tuller. A link to register for this program is located in the resources box on the left side of your screen. I want to thank T.J. Woodward once again for an excellent presentation today, and I'd also like to thank Foundation's Recovery Network for making today's program possible. Finally, a big thank you to our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional Webinar. This concludes today's presentation.